Welcome to a special edition of Come Follow Up Footnotes. For this unique discussion, we'll be focusing on increasing our understanding of references to skin color in the Book of Mormon. To do that, we've invited a special panel to join us. On this panel, we have Patrick Mason. Patrick is an author, presenter, and religious historian who is a professor at Utah State University. He teaches courses on Mormonism, American religious history, and religion, violence, and peacebuilding. He and his wife, Melissa, have four children and live in Logan, Utah. Welcome, Patrick. Thanks, Ben. So good to be here. We're also joined by Anthony Rivera. Anthony is an influential Native American leader from the Juanenio Band of Mission Indians of the Ahachaman Nation in Orange County, California. He is an adjunct instructor at BYU and has taught in the church's seminaries and institute of religion programs. He and his wife, Jill, have three daughters. Welcome, Anthony. Thank you for being here. And we also have Dr. LaShawn Williams. LaShawn is a licensed clinical social worker and relational change strategist. She is a featured speaker and presenter regarding the topic of race, diversity, and connection. She and her three children live in Orem, Utah. Welcome, LaShawn. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have this discussion. I think that there, uh, there are some, some questions that uh, we can help others answer and uh, just some understanding that we can uh, create and help build when it comes to talking about race and some specific things that are mentioned in the Book of Mormon. I'd like to start out, however, by establishing something from the get-go. President Nelson has emphasized recently that our three most important identifiers are we are sons and daughters of God, we are children of the covenant, and we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Specifically, when it comes to talking about uh, a sensitive topic like this, why is it important that we can understand and agree on how we identify first and foremost should be as sons and daughters of God? Well, I think, I think it's so significant because that is our first identity. That's who we are before anything else. And, and I think, you know, God delights in all of the diversity that we see mm -hmm. around the world in terms of culture and skin color and race and, and all of the ideas and all these kinds of things. But fundamentally and foundationally, before all of that, the thing that every single one of us have in common is that we are a daughter or a son of God. Absolutely. And I believe that when you do have that fundamental foundation that we are brothers and sisters, mm -hmm and that we believe and follow a savior who is also extremely loving. And if we can start at that point, then we can definitely deal with some very challenging situations and, and scriptures like, like we see today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think starting with that phrase that we are all siblings in Christ and we're all striving towards these certain things, then our questions become challenged when, when we have to answer to well, what does it mean that there's this idea of a curse? And then this idea of brothers and sisters in Christ and siblings in Christ and striving towards unity, when it comes into question, how do we respond? Mm -hmm. That's then our challenge. And I think the Book of Mormon does a great job of, uh, of teaching that overall understanding. And instead of just zeroing in on one specific thing yeah. that might be uh, uh, detrimental or confusing or even hurtful sometimes or, or offensive, that if you are looking at this bigger, bigger picture that is in the text, uh, in the scripture, then it's a little bit easier to, to move forward in not only understanding, teaching, but also uh, knowing uh, and, and confirming that knowledge that, that God is loving and that, mm -hmm. and that his, his Savior is is a focal point for us. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, not only is the Book of Mormon another testament of Jesus Christ, it's a testament of what happens when people forget that foundational mm -hmm. truth. That's right. When they put other identities first and, and allow that to create rivalry, antagonism, hatred, right. violence, competition. right? Competition. Uh, competition, right? So the moments of the greatest righteousness in the Book of Mormon are the moments where Nephites and Lamanites are getting along just fine right. because they're siblings in Christ, mm -hmm. because they're daughters and sons of God. Yeah. And when they forget that, then, then things fall apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. right. So I'd like to start with uh, jumping straight into some of the text and some of the actual scriptures 
that brings some of these things uh, up. Patrick, do you mind introducing some of that to us here? Yeah, sure. So as we look into 2 Nephi 5, which is what we're gonna focus on here, the, the context here is important in terms of this is the end of an era. This is Lehi and Sariah have led their family across the ocean. Uh, they're in the promised land. And uh, there's always been this rivalry uh, among the brothers, but now uh, in 2 Nephi chapter four, Lehi gives different blessings to the, to the family and, and invokes a, a, a sense of, of covenant. He, he talks about this in 2 Nephi chapter one, that if you keep the commandments, you'll be blessed. If not, you'll, you'll be cursed. You'll mm -hmm. separate yourself from God. And right. this is a message he gives to the entire family, not just to some of the brothers, right? right? That this is a general rule that he gives to all of them. And then in 2 Nephi chapter four, he, he passes away. Uh, and despite his warnings, despite all of the efforts, you know, of the past uh, several years in 2 Nephi 5, we do see the family split apart. Mm -hmm. Finally, the, the followers of Laman and Lemuel threaten violence. So Nephi feels that they have to leave. And so this is really the beginning of where we see Nephites and Lamanites. Mm -hmm. And so right on the heels of that, uh, in chapter five, we see what Nephi reports on this division between the people, and, and then he talks about what happens next. And this begins in verse 20 of chapter five. He says, wherefore the word of the Lord was fulfilled, which he spake unto me, saying that inasmuch as they will not hearken unto thy words, they shall be cut off from the presence of the Lord. And behold, they, speaking about his brothers, they were cut off from his presence. And he had caused the cursing to come upon them, yea, even a sore cursing because of their iniquity. For behold, they had hardened their hearts against him, that they had become like unto a flint. Wherefore, as they were white and exceedingly fair and delightsome, that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. This verse, especially verse 21, introduces these concepts and some of this language that we'll see carried through in other verses as well in terms of a, of a curse, talking about skin, talking about whiteness and blackness. These are, this is gonna carry through in some other passages, but we, we, we see it kind of all coming together in this verse. All right, LaShawn, I just wanna get your thoughts. First time you read this, mm. what are you thinking? The first time I read it, I am wondering, well, what does this mean? Because mm -hmm. the way I read it, when they were cut off, then they were cursed. There wasn't really anything prior to that said because they were bad, because they're all people, then they, they removed themselves. And then because they removed themselves, a cursing came upon them. And if this is what I'm given to work with and I can't do anything else that's contextual, then it's like, okay, so that they might not be enticing unto my people, the Lord God did cause a skin of blackness to come upon them. What does that mean? There you go. What is, why, why does that mean to make, to ensure that I'm not enticing? The first thing you see about me is a thing that's supposed to be less than enticing. Mm -hmm. What does that do to a person? Not, my, not the content of my character, but the color of my skin is supposed to keep you away from me. It's supposed to be a thing that from far away, when you see me, you're supposed to know everything about me. Mm -hmm. That's what that says to me. Yeah, so on this first reading, right? I mean, that's, that's damaging, right? And that's I a mean, big that's... part of why we were having this conversation yes. to, to discuss what do we make of this? Uh, is this telling the whole story? Correct. And if not, what else can we learn? Yeah, so I think it's important to recognize what does the text actually say, mm -hmm. but also it's just as important to say what is it not actually right. saying. Yes. Well, and you know, if you go to contextually, like if you look at Nephi's psalm back in chapter four, he's going through it. Mm -hmm. He is crying out to God and he is saying all of these things and all the ways that he needs help. Earlier in chapter five, he says, now I do not write upon these plates all the words which they murmured against me, but it sufficeth me to say that they did seek to take away my life. Everything he's gone through, all of his anguish, and then when given a chance to separate and to understand why are my brothers like this? Why have they treated me this way? They've cut themselves off, they're cursed, they're bad, and then they get to be the bad guys. But this is Nephi's experience. And maybe what if we treat it like Nephi's experience and not something that we're really supposed to liken into ourselves that becomes then our experience with each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like Anthony, as, as we've talked about, you, you've, you've done a deep dive into, because we're talking about words here and yeah. language, right? right? And, and what, what these words mean. And, right. and so, so if, especially if we go beyond a kind of superficial first glance, mm -hmm. right? As, as we think deeper about these words, what, what do you? For, for me, as a, as a scholar of ancient languages, not only my own uh, native language, but also biblical languages as well, in Hebrew and Aramaic and other 
other scriptural type languages, I'm concerned with, okay, well, what do these words really mean? Mm -hmm. I'm seeing them in English, but I know that, that uh, Nephi is not speaking English, <laughs> right? right? Right. He's speaking Hebrew. He's thinking Hebrew. So I would, I, I would look at many of these words like cursing, blackness, even the word skin and the word uh, flint, mm -hmm. and even the, the, the other opposite words like, like, um, like white mm -hmm. and fair and delightsome, delightsome. The, these types of words also. I'm curious to know what do they really mean. Mm -hmm. The word curse in, in Hebrew is this word arur, and we find it first appearing in um, the, the creation story, in the garden story. And the first time it appears is when God curses the serpent, which is interesting because it looks like cursing has something to do with following the serpent, if you will, or mm -hmm. Satan. Mm -hmm. Now, we know God is not cursing a snake, right? That he doesn't like snakes, and so he's cursing a snake. <laughs> we know that, right? And we know that that's figurative. But the, the cursing, this word ahur, is very interesting. It can mean a number of different things, such as being cut off, such as losing something like light. And it's a very interesting word. There seems to be a play on, on words there. The other word that I want to comment on really quickly is skin, mm -hmm. because that seems to be the one that folks think that it's actually mm -hmm. this stuff here. The word for skin that we find in, in Hebrew is this word or. And this word or can mean a number of different things. It doesn't just mean this kind of stuff on my body. It can mean nakedness, physical and in the sense of, of being exposed. Mm -hmm. Or it could mean losing something. These two words are related. So if I say, okay, well, there's multiple meanings than just meaning physical skin that is dark, maybe that's not what's actually happening here, the way I'm looking at it first read, mm -hmm. because throughout the scripture it is balancing mm -hmm. some of these things. So there, there's, there's deeper meanings into these words. So then how, as, as you look at verse 21, then with yeah. your knowledge of all these things, then what do you see, or yeah. how, how do you read this then? Yeah. The way I look at this is based off of how I read it in the, in the Hebrew Bible, okay? The colors are interesting, mm -hmm. and I believe they are symbolic because throughout the Hebrew Bible, colors are never used in association to physical skin. Correct. Mm. It's so fascinating. Correct. So in the whole Hebrew Bible, if they're not doing that in the whole Hebrew Bible, why would they be doing that here? So I think there's something here that is figurative and uh, symbolic when it comes to that what, what is happening here, that God is causing a countenance, if you will, mm -hmm. of darkness, mm -hmm. which is the absence of light. And therefore, that people are seeing that and noticing, I don't know if, if I want to be associated with that because there is no light, there's no spirit. And, and, and that, that perspective really helps make sense of some other passages in the Book of Mormon uh -huh. where a curse is removed and there's no talk of anything else going on, yes. right? right? And where the curse is just clearly about somebody's relationship with God. So I think there's several instances, but a couple we could look at. Uh, in Alma chapter 23, and this is the account of the anti-Nephi-Lehi's, in chapter 23, verse 17 and 18, and it came to pass that they called their names anti-Nephi-Lehi's, they were called by this name and were no more called Lamanites. Mm -hmm. And they began to be a very industrious people, they were friendly with the Nephites, they opened a correspondence with them, and the curse of God did no more follow them. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no mention here of marks or skin yeah. or anything like this, but the curse of God, their separation from God, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, you know, they chose to repent and, and that's, that gets erased. Sort of think about Samuel the Lamanite, right? Mm -hmm. One of the greatest prophets mm -hmm. uh, in the entire Book of Mormon. Everybody knows he's a Lamanite yep. culturally mm -hmm. and in terms of his background, his ethnicity, whatever mm -hmm. word we want to use to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But he's the one that Jesus says, hey, remember what he said? Put that back in the scriptures, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and so, so when we bring this other perspective, it actually helps make sense mm -hmm. of all these times in the Book of Mormon where we see people repenting a curse of separation from God 
God being removed because they bring themselves back through the power of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. into the presence of God. Right. Uh, they reconcile themselves with God. And that's and so the curse is removed. That's what mm -hmm. the curse is. And we also is. need to understand that in the context of cursing, there's always another parallel to it, and that is the blessing. Mm -hmm. Right. And they go together. Because whenever you you see in the Book of Mormon they're talking about cursing, they have probably just talked about blessing. Lehi certainly does. That's yes. right. Yeah. Lehi does this, and he and the cursing is is conditional. You're going to lose something. You will be cut off, and therefore it's going to bring some type of a, an impact on your soul. As it should. If you cut yourself off from God, it should have right. an impact on you. And right. that's the thing, they chose to remove themselves. So that's how right. could you not be cursed by choosing to remove yourself from God? That's right. And have you ever been around somebody that you can tell that? Almost, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we all have. On both both sides. On right. both Absolutely. sides. Yeah, you can see it when there's somebody who has specifically removed themselves, and you can see it in those that have you know, intentionally, you know, clung to uh, that relationship. You can right. see that light. It's, it just seems yeah. a little brighter, a little more noticeable. Mm -hmm. So both of those are part of what is this, this covenant process. Mm -hmm. Because blessings are definitely part of covenant making. Mm -hmm. And cursings are also part of covenant making. Sure. Mm -hmm. Because if you remember... In, uh, um, in the Old Testament, in chapter 12 of Genesis, God tells Abraham, as he's teaching him about covenant making, he tells him, I will bless those that bless you mm -hmm. and curse those that, that curse, curse you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this duality, this parallel part. There are blessings and penalties for rebellion against mm -hmm. those covenants. So, so there's, there's this a, is covenant language. There's a certain way that it's descriptive, not prescriptive in the sense it's just yeah. describing what it's like mm -hmm. to either be closer to or further away yeah. from, from godliness. Yeah. yeah. And if God is a source of light and covenants draws closer to him naturally, when you enter that covenant, what's gonna happen to you? You're gonna receive that light. Mm -hmm. right. And as you separate yourself, you're removing yourself from that light, mm -hmm. which naturally would lead to darkness. That right? is correct. Mm -hmm. Now, let me say something about that. Okay. Um, the word for skin is the word or in Hebrew. The word for light is the word or in Hebrew. It's the same sounding word, but the first letter is different in each one. Hmm. Skin has an ayin letter at the front, or, whereas light has an Aleph letter at the front, or. It and sounds they, the same to me. They sound <laughs> the same. <laughs> they they right, sound the same. I'm yes. missing something. Right, right. <laughs> Homophone, right? Mm -hmm. They sound the same, but they are working together in the sense that there is some contrast between them as well. And that's why I think they're using this word or this English word that gets translated mm -hmm. as skin to convey this idea of a contrast between light and darkness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily have to mean skin color. I think it's meaning something more than mm -hmm. that. And I think that's so fascinating like, to, to get this background. Part of the challenge we have though is that most readers of the Book of Mormon don't have your training in ancient Hebrew sure, languages, sure. right? And yeah. so, so the text that gets delivered and published in 1830, right, gets delivered in an American context where language has is full of racial connotations, right? right? In 1830, well, especially, and yeah. and, and, and yes. still today in the 21st century, mm -hmm. but especially in 1830, right? Yeah, right. Where, where white and black. They're not just colors, that there's a kind of moral connotation, Absolutely. lightness and darkness and so forth. So, yeah. so the readers of the Book of Mormon in the, in the modern period, which of course the Book of Mormon is written for our time, you know, we bring all these assumptions to the yes. text when we read the word yeah. skin of blackness, yes. when right. we read white right. and black and so forth, because we're reading mm -hmm. English. Yes, yeah. and right. what does it facilitate? What do we profit from being able to do that? What do we gain from being able to see, aha, here is how you know badness. When God curses people, it's never forever. When Miriam got cursed with leprosy for having an issue that Moses married Zipporah, she was cursed with leprosy for a couple of days, learned her lesson, leprosy gone. <laughs> when Alma the Younger is cursed because of what he does to work against God, he's cursed, has his issues, relearns his lesson, curse is gone, right? Joseph, someone gets cursed with mutism, you know, they can't speak, but it's temporary like this, and then when you learn your lesson, okay, cool, it's gone. 
Never does it last forever and ever and ever. Never does it go against the and consistency. Never is it unconditional. Never is it unconditional. And right. so it goes against the second article of faith, that man would be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgressions. So why would my blackness be some extension of this curse that comes from this book that was translated and published in 1830 about people from generations and millennia ago? That does not match with the consistency of a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes, and, and that's right. And if it's, if it's unconditional, that means there are conditions. And the conditions are that you can return back to God through repentance and accepting him or, or what, what he says, they, they desired me to be their God and therefore I make covenants with them. So there are conditions to this curse, right? And, but it doesn't mean that, okay, well, I'm turning back to God and therefore I accept him and I'm doing my best to be righteous. My skin's not going to change colors. Mm -hmm. Imagine the scorekeeping, right? Yeah, like, okay, so that. who is dark now? Yeah. They confuse. I thought, how did this happen, right? That's a lot of work. And God is not the author of confusion. Yeah. It would be so confusing if we had to say bad behavior, black, good behavior, white. But the thing is, we don't get the exit out of this belief that blackness is bad. There's no exit for us. We are left with blackness is bad, and then we just hold on to that. Yeah. No matter how many times it changes back and forth based on behavior, we hold on to that, and that's on us. That's not on, that's not on God. That's something that we bring because there's some benefit that we get out of it. And if you have never had to sit and actually ask God, am I cursed? Not what comes first, my blackness or my divinity. Am I cursed? Because that's what I'm being taught. That's why you have to go and study to say, does this word really mean what, what you're saying it means? Because it doesn't feel right in my spirit. Imagine going into baptism hoping that this can clean you and that you're cleansed, but then you still have to grow up in the church hearing that your blackness, your brownness is a curse. But what did I get baptized for? If it was supposed to wash mm -hmm. away everything, what was the point? So unless you have the experience where you have to actually go and say, am I cursed? Because there's no exit out of the curses besides I'm going to be white. I don't know how to be white. I've never been white my whole life. I'm supposed to go to heaven and then be white. I'm not going to know how to act. Like, what's going to, how do I do this now in heaven? Like, this would have been so cool back on earth. There was a whole lot of awesomeness about being white. But like, now that I'm in heaven and I'm white, like, what do I do? How do I recognize myself? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's so many things that don't follow if we're really going to believe that blackness is this curse. Right. It can't be if we think all the way through it, but we don't because there's a benefit in not having to think that hard. This makes mm. it easy for me to make judgments, for me to say that you are good and that's why you are enslaved. I'm a descendant of the enslaved in this country. This helped that happen. When you have the enslaved that are in the, the camps, it's, we're almost in July, almost a pioneer day. When you've got the enslaved who are in the, the pioneer hand carts, this confirms this is why you were. But then you see and you watch things happen where people work against the idea of the curse. You see what Brigham Young does and what he doesn't do. And so we don't wrestle with those things. But isn't the Book of Mormon so much about people wrestling mm -hmm. with themselves yeah. and wrestling with God? If we're not prompted to wrestle, we don't question this. Yeah, We yeah. let it benefit us so that we feel comfortable and that we don't have to really worry about it much else. I love that. And, it, and it's so much of it is about, so what are you bringing to the text in terms of how are you reading it? And, and so if, if you're coming at this text with certain ideas about race and whiteness and blackness and so forth, there will be these passages, right, which maybe exacerbate or jump out sure. or, or give you ammunition mm -hmm. uh, to do that, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it be in 2 Nephi 5 or some of the things that Jacob said or 3 Nephi 2 or some other passages, right? Whereas if you start with what we started this conversation with, that all are alike unto God, yes. right? That the God is the parent of the entire human family, yes. right? The God actually created the races in all of their beauty and diversity. Yes. If you bring that, then, then that lens makes you see the text in a very mm -hmm. different way. For sure. Right? Yeah, and I think that is the right starting point to examine something like this as a, a, a Lamanite person. And, and the, night, the nice thing about the Book of Mormon is it says, that even though they're going through many of these things and, and destructions and all this, this kind of stuff, that there still will be a remnant that will be blessed and will come to Christ who will benefit from, from these great blessings mm -hmm. of the love of God and salvation. As a, as a Lamanite person, Native American type person, we, we fairly usually don't talk to each other about skin color. 
we really not, it's really not a big deal to us. <laughs> and it's not something we sit around and talk about because it's really not about that. I don't know if you're cursed or blessed or not, mm -hmm. okay? For us, it's about, well, uh, wh what do I feel about the creator and what am I doing to help my family and my clan and my people, which is a, a wonderful thing to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. And I, I would say the same thing within the Polynesian culture very similar. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that has to do with some of the cultural upbringings and cultural traditions mm -hmm. um, to not focus uh, on, on, you know, specifically with skin color and things like that. You have a different experience. I sure do. Because as much <laughs> as we talk about, even if we agreed, you know, 100%, this is not what the Book of Mormon is saying. Mm -hmm. We still have to go back to the fact that those of African descent could not hold a priesthood within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Saints that sends a whole new message. It does. Right? So does. that's a whole other side and a whole other issue that has to be brought up and talked about. Because if you pass this off, okay, that's not what it meant. Okay, well then how do we deal with how? that other side of the modern Church of Jesus Christ or Latter-day Saints and how we have dealt with these issues? I would mm -hmm. love to get some of your thoughts, well, and, and just put a point on that. I mean, it's like the, the, this, you know, this is talking about Lamanites and so forth. People of African descent don't fit within right. this Lamanite <laughs> schema, right. but... These, some of these texts were used and have been used over the years to, to justify or explain mm -hmm. uh, that, that priesthood temple mm -hmm. exclusion and yeah. some of the other attitudes that people yeah. have. Yeah. Point, yeah. Yeah. This is the olive tree that black people were grafted into, right? Mm -hmm. And in so many ways, black communities and black cultures, with having Christianity pushed upon us through colonialism and through enslavement, who has been a bigger fighter for Jesus if not the black community? Mm -hmm. Who has used Jesus to believe in something better than what's happening right now? Mm -hmm. If anybody has been a believer in Christ, it has been black people, black community, and black churches that we were grafted into this expectation that something about us was wrong. Well, not my Jesus, <laughs> not in my life, not in my world. And so the thing is, I've never had the luxury of being able to believe what white men tell me about myself to be true. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so within that, within my family, it's always been, you focus on Jesus. You listen to what Jesus says and you go, you take this to God. I didn't serve a mission because of these verses. Mm. I knew that wow. I could not serve a mission wow. and not answer this from my truth and my lived experience. I couldn't do it. Then I went into study. And that was when I recognized, oh, because of what they did, then they were cut off. Mm -hmm. It wasn't cursed first, then cut off. It wasn't blackness first, then separation. It was because separation, then this idea around blackness. And the work of Marvin Perkins, Darius Gray has been pivotal in my ability to, to maneuver and to manage my way through this. I gave a talk in one of my wards back in 2017, and I pulled this quote. Um, Every black person that I know, we have a story of when we asked, is this true? Am I cursed? Because at some point I got to know. I already know what I'm being told. Because somebody told you. Somebody or told you, me. Right, right. Somebody told me who I could date, who I could marry, who I could hang out with, who I could be around. And within black communities, we have these things around our own internalized racism about you can't be too dark. Mm. So I embody this color, this color line, right? For a number of reasons that won't be happening in this conversation. Um, but most black people I know, we are existing within this idea of, I know for a fact I am not cursed. I don't know why you need me to be cursed. <laughs> but I don't need me to be cursed in order for me to be a follower of Christ. Be, me believing that I'm cursed does not ensure my discipleship. It actually pushes me away. So. With God as the ultimate scientist, we're all 99.9% .9 the same, right, genetically. Of the DNA, we've got a three billion base pairs of chromosomes, right, that combine into about 35,000 genes that then determine our characteristics. And of those 35,000, only 10 of them have as much to do with skin color, right? And when you think about skin as an evolutionary process, 10 out of, 33, out of 3 billion that I'm cursed? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. God is not the author of confusion. God is the ultimate scientist. So with mm -hmm. that being true, then... You think about the word black and you think about this as a Hebrew text from the Hebrew Bible, from Hebrew people that came. And the work of Marvin Perkins and, and Darius Gray says that the word black itself is found 44 times in the scriptures, 26 in the Old and New Testament combined. And of those 26, nine times refers to the elements, four times refers to hair, three times refers to a horse, and one time to part of a building Eight times when black refers to man, but it always refers to man in the experience. I'm having a blackened experience. My, my, my soul is black. Mm -hmm. my, my, my skin is black upon me. My bones are burned with heat. Um, this is in, in Job. Um, 
Solomon says, I am black but comely. But you think about Solomon and he says, he's sad about a lot of things. But I'm handsome. I know I'm going through it, but I'm handsome right now. Um, in Jeremiah, for the hurt of my daughter of my people, I'm hurt, I'm black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. All the ways that black is used in the scriptures, if we're going to say from continental Africa, come to northern, the North and South and American continents and establish a people, language comes. Therefore, language should translate and should be similar. So how blackness means in Hebrew, we should read blackness in the, the Book of Mormon similarly. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. Those references in, in Hebrew come from different words mm -hmm. in, in Hebrew that are trying to convey this idea. Uh, you know, for example, Jeremiah says, uh, I am black, I am right? Black. Mm -hmm. And he uses this word which talks about his mourning, mm -hmm. right? The mourning of Jerusalem and people are dying. And then he says it again in Lamentations. Mm -hmm. Four, which, eight. Which is interesting, right? <laughs> yes. Right? He says that. He does. And in a book about mourning. About mourning. Yeah. Their visage is blacker than a coal. They are not known in the streets. Their skin cleaveth to their bones. It is withered. It has become like yes. a stick. He is, he is mourning for... Uh, and this is the the countenance of the world yes. at the time. Yes, it's fascinating and and true, and that needs to be injected in here, or at least considered. I think uh, uh, I like to consider it, and then I like sometimes to replace it, and read it with that kind with of understanding. Gloomy, with sadness. With sadness. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm. And then it starts to make more sense. Mm -hmm. Oh, I understand now what the, what's happening. And maybe that helps with 3 Nephi 2, where it talks about them becoming white. Same right? thing. Maybe, yeah, right. so, so it's, the, it's, it's both on the darkness, blackness side, but also the whiteness, lightness side. Same thing as, in the Hebrew well. Bible. Yes. You know, white, Levon is not referring, it refers to many other things, mm -hmm. white. Uh, Isaiah, right? Yes. Isaiah says, though your sins be red, right? Scarlet or crimson, mm -hmm. they shall be as white as snow mm -hmm. and wool. Mm -hmm. These are impressions of feeling and spirit mm -hmm. more than colors of, of physical colors of things. You know, I think it's important as we have this discussion, you know, here we sit around this table, we're all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, mm -hmm. and we have the, the luxury of being able to listen to prophets, seers, and revelators, and who receive modern revelation that really does clarify, at, at minimum, the, our church's modern stance on some of these issues. I would love to discuss some of the things that our current prophets, seers, and revelators, and other church leaders are saying and doing mm -hmm. uh, to help promote peace, yes. to help heal some of the hurt that has been happening for, for decades. Yes. Uh, Patrick, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so there's several things we could look at. Maybe one thing is an essay that the church uh, published uh, and is on the website under the gospel topics uh, part of the church's website called Race and the Priesthood. And it talks about the history and, uh, and so forth. But I think very importantly, it includes this uh, statement. So it's today, the church disavows the theories advanced in the past that black skin is a sign of divine disfavor or curse, or that it reflects unrighteous actions in a premortal life, that mixed race marriages are a sin, or that blacks or people of any other race or ethnicity are inferior in any way to anyone else. Church leaders today unequivocally condemn all racism, past and present, in any form. Now that doesn't take away past hurts, doesn't take away you know the, uh, the you know the the wrongs that have been done in the past, but it, but it makes very clear mm -hmm. where where the church stands today, and it says. Those theories that have been advanced in the past, we disavow that. That's very strong language. The church very rarely uses that kind of language. We disavow mm -hmm. those kinds of theories. So if you've read the Book of Mormon this way, yeah. the church disavows that kind of reading of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, and I would like, knowing that, I think it would be nice. I know I'm going to do this. I'm going to read the Book of Mormon this year, moving forward instead of dragging the past with me. Sure. So with that kind of information and position or truth, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's truth, fact, right. with those kind of truths coming from a, a living prophet, I'm going to be reading the Book of Mormon in a new light mm -hmm. and understanding these things the way they probably should be understood with, I like what you said, 
about your your relative telling you focus on Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I find when you do that, these things seem to work out a little bit better. And I seem to understand it a little bit better with that focus in mind, instead of dragging my luggage of, mm-hmm. of the past with me. Well, and I think if we focus on the Book of Mormon, I'm a therapist. If I read this about the mental health of these different people, a lot more makes sense to me too. <laughs> a lot more makes sense yeah. to me too. Well, and, and, and consider what President Russell M. Nelson said in October 2020 General yes. Conference. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, I assure you that your standing before God is not determined by the color of your skin. Favor or disfavor with God is dependent on your devotion to God and his commandments and not the color of your skin. I grieve that our black brothers and sisters the world over are enduring the pains of racism and prejudice. Today, I call upon our members everywhere to lead out in abandoning attitudes and actions of prejudice. I plead with you to promote respect for all of God's children. So it's not just disavowing, Mm -hmm. right? Now we're moving into the in proactive language, right? To lead out in abandoning these attitudes and and to promote respect for everyone. To bring the world his truth. That's right. Yes. Build Zion. Yes. First of all, I feel like we could talk. We could. (laughs) We could. We could go on forever and ever. We could. To wrap up this discussion, how do you lead out to do exactly what uh, President Nelson is saying to promote peace, to to promote respect for all of God's children. Uh, LaShawn, I'd like to start with you. I think a lot of it has to do with our fear about the word contention. And that was another word that I had to go and look up and understand because to contend actually means to strive with, to actually move with people. And you can contend with anger or you can contend with peace and with connection and with collaboration. Contending is not bad. It's how we contend that's important. And so when it comes to this idea of rooting out and abandoning attitudes of prejudice and actions of racism, that is a Lord is it I moment. Mm-hmm. That is a Lord is Great it I point. moment. What am I doing? Actions, but also actions of commission and omission. What am I not doing? Right. Right? So if I'm going to lead out and abandoning, if I'm going to root something out, that doesn't mean I just cut it off so everything looks good on the surface. I'm getting down to the roots of it and getting rid of that. And that's the important piece. We've got to figure out what is rooted deep within me, whether I, ha- I asked for it or not. What is rooted deep within me that makes me look at my skin or anyone else's as anything less than the scientific miracle that is melanin uh-huh. and that is God's creation of people? Anything that's rooted in me that gets in my way of seeing somebody as a sibling of mine in Christ striving towards perfection is what I need to root out. I think we need more room for those conversations. Mm-hmm. How, do we, how do we repair and undo harm? How do we root that out of ourselves first? Keep it from rooting into our children. Acknowledge it when it's in our friends and our conversations. How do we contend towards being siblings in Christ? Mm-hmm. Thanks, LaShawn. Mm-hmm. Uh, for me, it's focusing on my Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ first and foremost. When I know my Heavenly Father loves me, and when I know my Savior Jesus Christ died for me out of love for me, and when I know that the Holy Spirit of truth can confirm all truths, then I know that I can understand these things and I can approach them in a way which I can know for myself. And once I know for myself, then I can uh, convey it to others and, and, and engage these discussions. As, as a faculty member in, in the ancient scripture department here at BYU, I teach Book of Mormon and, uh, and other ancient scripture. And I, I thoroughly enjoy approaching these that way, these scriptures, and even these challenging scriptures mm-hmm. with a body of students who are also searching for truth. There's some edification that can be, happen and can be done in engaging these properly by the Spirit and with those that knowledge that, that you can know the truth. Yes. Oh, thanks, Anthony. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, as, as the most melanin-challenged person <laughs> uh, at, at the table, I mean, I, I, I come at it um, from, from a different perspective. And, and for me, it's involved a lot of listening 
uh, to other people because my experience and the body I was born into and my ancestry is is different than some of my other sisters and brothers. And so for me, what's that meant is it's a res responsibility to, to hear the stories of other people, to try to to see, you know, I can never put myself in somebody else's shoes, but but to try, I mean, this is one of our Christ-like virtues, right? To empathize with others, to mm -hmm. mourn with others. And, and, the baptismal and, and, covenant exactly. to that's, do it. That's, that's my job as a Christian, right? Every I accepted Sunday. that job yes. description the, the, yes. the day I got baptized and every week. And every Sunday. When I, when I take the sacrament. So a lot of it is listening. And then that listening has led to, to being inspired uh, by it and then trying to, to pass it on in whatever circles I'm in. And so my family and I were recently on a road trip. We were traveling across the, the country. We we're going to church history sites and so forth. But as we were driving through Topeka, Kansas, I saw the sign for the Brown v. Board National Historic Monument. We're like, okay, kids, we're getting off the, you know, they did not want to go to one more museum. But I said, we're going to this one, <laughs> right? I want you to understand that their experience is different than ours, mm -hmm. but we can be inspired by people who, who fought for the values that I think Jesus taught Absolutely. of love and equality and justice and respect for all. Mm -hmm. Well, what you lack in a melanin, you make up for in, in your heart. <laughs> I have to balance it it's out a, somehow, a right? <laughs> well, I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed uh, being a part of this conversation and, and listening to, to you all. I, I really hope that this is a springboard uh, for, for everyone to take an opportunity to really try to understand not only what the scriptures are teaching with the words of modern prophets, but what is really in your heart. And that we can all walk away with a greater desire to view each other as sons and daughters of God and to create that spirit of unity among us. Thank you all for being here and for participating in this. It's been a wonderful experience. Thank you, Thanks, awesome. thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. And thank you at home for joining us for this special Footnotes discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please share with us on Facebook or Instagram.